ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهدي ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا وعظيمنا وحبيبنا محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وسيا وسيكم بتقوى الله قال تعالى اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد سمع الله قول التي تجادلك في زوجها وتشتكي الى الله الله يسمع تحاوركما ان الله سميع بصير وقال تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا هو انفسكم واهلكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجاره عليها ملائكه غلاظ شداد لا يعصون الله ما امرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بما يضرب احدكم امراته ضرب الفهل وفي روايه ضرب العبد ثم لعله يعانقها اما بعد there was a sahaba a great sahaba whose name was ubad ibn samit رضي الله تعالى عنه and he had a brother named aws ibn samit رضي الله تعالى عنه and he had remarried and married a woman named khawla رضي الله تعالى عنها and as is the, the famous story is narrated that there was a ongoing dispute between the both of them that had not really been resolved as you know it's common place in many families there are problems that never really get resolved they just sort of get pushed into the closet swept under the rug and these challenges sort of build and build and build and build over time and so on one occasion when aws radiyallahu ta'ala had was attracted to his wife and he approached her and she resisted and there was an argument between the both of them and the argument ended in such a way that he had divorced her using the jahili the old method of divorce in the pre-islamic time which had a dual effect the effect one of this divorce being the kind of divorce that left her hanging meaning she could never be remarried again in the this was the practice of the old pre-islamic jahili time and so she had to it was a divorce but paradoxically she had to stay in the marriage and it deprived her of all of her rights in the marriage that was the kind of divorce that he gave her she was stuck in a marriage with no rights and prevented from living out the rest of her free life by remarrying if she wanted to and on top of that she really loved him we have disputes and arguments with people all the time family members people we care about etc but we never want long lasting harm but the effect was done so they sat down and they talked about what to do and aws radiyallahu ta'ala he said all i know is you are haram for me that's what he said that was the old jahili result so she went to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
And the Prophet ﷺ had not received any new wahi, any new revelation on that particular issue. And he ﷺ wanted to solve her problem. But he didn't, he was cautious not to make a new hukum, a new judgment on something that Allah Ta'ala had not decided upon already. Especially given the fact that the Qur'an was still being revealed. And so he said, all I know is that he is haram for you. And then she said, I'll take my shikaya, my, my complaint to Allah Ta'ala. And she raised her hands and she said, Allahumma ashku ilayk. Ya Rabb, I send all of my complaints to you. In other words, at this point, I have lost all hope of any help from your khalq, from your creation. I'm turning only to you. But the Mufassirun say that on a daily basis, she would make this dua to Allah Ta'ala and then she would go to the Prophet ﷺ to check and see if there had been any answer, any wahi that had come down to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ would tell her, not today. In other words, there was no answer today. He too, ﷺ was expecting something. She said, Ya Rasulullah, we have a child together. He said, all I know is, uh, you are haram for each other. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I love him. That's what she said. You know, I love him. He said, all I know is, you're haram for him. But he was waiting too. And she persisted in her complaint to Allah Ta'ala about her affair. Silently. She took it straight to Allah Ta'ala. And then finally Allah Ta'ala revealed not just an ayah, but an entire chapter of the Qur'an that would be recited forever. And he begins in a very scary uh, prof but profound way, manner. And he begins with Qad. Qad Sami'a. And the ulama say that Qad here, as the first word of the ayah, is a, is a dalala, it's an indicator that the Prophet ﷺ was anticipating and expecting an answer. In other words, he ﷺ saw that injustice to her as well, and he was waiting for that, anticipating that, the same way as the Musallis, the people in the Masjid, are sitting in the rows, waiting for the Salat, and then the Iqama comes, Qad Qamat Salat. Everyone's waiting for the Salat, now the Salat time has come. Your anticipation, your waiting, has been heard. Qad Qamat Salat. Now you rise for the Salat. Five seconds ago, you wouldn't rise. But now, Qad Qamat Salat. Qad is used in anticipation. And to relieve the listener from further waiting. قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا Now Allah Ta'ala has revealed to you the fact that indeed He has heard the, com the concern that that woman mentioned to you about her husband and He heard the complaint she made to Allah Ta'ala. And then he so first he mentions Qad Samia. The time of anticipation has, has ended. Allah has heard it. Samia. Then he mentions the word Samia to hear a second time in the same ayah. Wallahu yasma'u tahawurukuma. And Allah, but here he mentions it in the present tense, before it was in the past. Allah heard, done. Now, Wallahu yasma'u. Allah Ta'ala hears. 
The man is istimrar, continuity. Not only did he hear that woman, but he heard and it's constantly resonating with Allah Ta'ala. Yani, he didn't hear it like we hear things, forget stuff, place it on the last list, put it on the to-do list. Maybe we'll do something, maybe we won't. Yeah, I heard you, okay, let me think about it. No, it's been heard and Allah Ta'ala hears it continuously. He's doing something about it. It just takes time in your world, not in his. He heard your tahawurukuma, the discussions, the conversations that both of you, Ya Rasulullah and this lady, both of you had. Allah knows he, love, he loves her and she loves him. Allah knows they had a child together. Allah knows they were upset. Things happened. She was disenfranchised. There was cruelty to her. Allah Ta'ala's heard and he hears what goes on. It's not forgotten within the maqam of Allah Ta'ala. So hearing a second time. Then, hearing comes in a third time, in the same ayah. Inna Allah sami'un basir. Allah Ta'ala is the all hearing. All seeing. قَدْ سَمِعَ وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ السَّمِيعَ قَدْ سَمِعَ He heard. وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعُ He hears. إِنَّ اللَّهَ السَّمِيعَ He's all hearing. This is really powerful. Especially in this month of Rajah. This month with it, which is the month of the Haram, one of the sacred months. It's also profoundly the month of the Isra and the Mi'raj, which we'll discuss next week, inshaAllah ta'ala, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. But there's a connection to the Isra and the Mi'raj and the fact that Allah ta'ala hears things. And the importance that this deen places not only on the protection and the salvation and the concern of the person and the individual, but also the importance, the ihtimam of the protection and the salvation of the family unit as a whole. Of the family. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, our mother, she said when this ayah came down, she said, ma asma'u. Oh, look at how Allah Ta'ala hears. See, the, Allah Ta'ala didn't say He sees. He saw what's going on. He noticed what's going on. No, Sami' al-Basir. Basir came at the end of the ayah. The important thing is the hearing. Because the victim wants to be heard. People in need want to be heard. Not observed. Not seen. Oftentimes they want anonymity, they want not to be seen oftentimes. But they want their complaint to be heard by someone. They want their concern to be heard. And not the kind of hearing that's external, the kind of hearing that's internal. Meaning you hear and you're really concerned about it, and that hearing moves you to do something. This is what is being presented We in this month begin the time of du'as to Allah Ta'ala. Ya Allah forgive me, Ya Allah do this, Ya Allah this, Ya Allah that. And Allah Ta'ala hears all of the du'as of all of the believers. But there's two kinds of people making du'as. There's the du'a of the person. And then who, who in their mind they haven't done anything perhaps. But then there's du'a of the maloom. The victim as well. And so we have to be very careful that all the du'as that we are saying to Allah Ta'ala, we have to be careful that others are not making du'as about something that we've done. Particularly, specifically, family members. The Prophet a group of women came to him in Medina. 
And they said, Ya Rasulullah, our husbands are hitting us. That's what they said. Our husbands are hitting us. And he وسلم, went to the masjid, ascended the minbar. This is, uh, you can read this in Bukhari as well, the text that I'm about to quote. Ascended the minbar. And he said, which is narrated in front of the, to, an, to the audience of men, sahabi, sahabas, بِمَا يَضْرِبُ أَحْدُكُمْ مِنْ What gives you the right to hit your women? What gives you the right to domestic abuse, to strike your wives? And this, by the way, was after the ayah which mentions Barb in it came down. It was after that. What gives you... Bima! By what right? Tell me what right you have to strike your wife, he said, sallallahu Darbul Fahd, the way you hit an animal, like you'd hit an animal, like you'd strike an animal, go, go, go. Wa fi riwayatin, darbul abd, the way a slave is beaten, as if your wife is a slave, as if your wife is some animal, some beast, that you control or that we control for subjugated, we subjugate them, when they don't do what we want them to do, we beat them or we hit them. By what right do you do that? This is in Bukhari. Then he said, the most profound part, ثُمَّ لَعَلَّهُ يُعَانِقُهَا And then after you beat her, you expect her to embrace you. SubhanAllah, Sadaqa Rasulullah. You expect her to embrace you. Or you expect to embrace, and you expect her to embrace you, which means you expect everything to be okay with her, or... You expect closeness from her. As if nothing happened. This became a profound text that the scholars talked about. Prophet Aisha never struck his wife or wives, never even struck his children. That's a serious bar to live up to, particularly with kids. Scholars of tafsir mention in Surah Tahreem, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O people of Iman, follow this, Qu anfusakum, save yourselves, wa ahlikum, and your ahl, and your families. By the way, ahl, in the Arabic language has two meanings. Your ahl, it, one it means family, as in wives and kids and parents, etc. The other meaning for ahl is, is, is a reference to your wife. So it can mean save your family from the hellfire. It can also mean save your wife from the hellfire. Now the ayah continues. Save yourself from the hellfire and then save your family, which includes obviously your wife specifically, the family generally, from, your hell, from the hellfire, وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارُ And the fuel, that, what, what keeps the fire going, obviously the reference is to Jahannam, but observe this, reflect on this, what keeps the fire going are nas, people, and stones. In other words, in the day of judgment, what keeps the fire going are people being constantly thrown into Jahannam. So the question is, well, what about the hijara? What are the stones that Allah Ta'ala is talking about here? Now, there is a wire from some of the Sahabas that talk about certain kinds of stones in the hellfire. But then most of the ulama relate something different. They say the stones that are being referenced here are not actual stones. This is another interpretation, a different ta'weel. One is the actual ma'na, real stones. But another interpretation is different. The other is that it's the meaning of not just human beings who've committed cruelty to people, to themselves and to their families, but the stones are the qulub al-qasiyah. Allah. The hard hearts. Allah. 
that are just as hard as stones. Those hard hearts that were not soft towards people. Subhanallah. People and stone. Jani kulu qasiya. Hard rock hearts. That those rock, those hearts which are not soft, which have never been moistened by any compassion, any shafqa, compassion towards the wife, compassion towards the husband, compassion towards the children. Hard hearts that have no idea what rahmah is. Because they're so cruel. And further acts of cruelty are constantly, constantly perpetuate further acts of cruelty. So the hard heart just keeps getting harder and harder and harder. And that, that tough, hard qalb, that is not salim, that is qasi, that is solid, tougher than steel. Man that doesn't cry. So Ya Rasulullah, you cry? How can you cry? One of them said. He said, because tears are dalala, it's a reference for a soft heart and a heart that has rahmah in it. So if tears and emotion from a man is a proof of rahmah and softness, then the rock hearts in Jahannam are proof of the absence of compassion, absence of mercy, absence of feeling. Decisions that are made by many of us that have no regard for people's lives and consequences. No care about kicking people, family members, out on the street, abusing kids. None. Brother came home to, 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 to his family the other day and said, after years of marriage, said, I can't stand to be 40 and, and be with you anymore. I have to leave. I've paid this month's rent. You're on your own. Goodbye. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. What kind of qalb? What kind of qalb? It's the kind of qalb that Allah Ta'ala references as a, as a hajar, a stone in Jahannam. He wants to give those of us that want to give our families hell in this life because of hard hearts, or there's a bigger hell in the next life that's going to be consuming our hard hearts. That's the meaning, of, that's one meaning of the ayah. So save yourself from having a hard heart so that it puts you in the hellfire, and save your family from your hard heart so that they aren't put in hell in this life and they do bad things that put them in hell in the next life. Allah Ta'ala hears. Because those family members can make dua. One of the maqasid, or one of the maqsads, one of the objectives of everything in the deen of Islam, one of them is the preservation of the family. The deen of Islam has priorities. Six. At the top is the preservation of the deen itself. The deen itself has to be preserved at all costs. If the deen goes away, now if a person doesn't know their deen, there's no masajid in the place, no concern about Allah, khalas, everything else is useless. So at the top is the preservation of the deen itself. And after that is the preservation of life itself. What good is the deen if nobody's around uh, to practice it? This is so life. And after that is the preservation of the mind. Because the deen requires not only living people, but thinking people. You have to know about salah. You have to have intentions for fasting. You have to have a sound akal, a sound mind for things. This is why khamar and all alcoholic beverages and drugs and intoxicants are prohibited. Because it disrupts and distorts and destroys the function of the mind. So the deen seeks to preserve that. This is why education is so important. This is why freedom of opinion is very important in the deen. It has to do with preservation of the intellect. Some homes is no opinion. One opinion, that's it. And at the fourth level is the preservation of the family. The family itself. Which means that anything that is that can contribute to the destruction of the family must be 
warded off and protected against. It's a harm. And protecting the family against harm is one thing, but benefiting the family is another thing. Now, protecting your family against harm in the Sharia is not the same thing as benefiting the family. In other words, if I want to protect myself from the cold, putting on a jacket, protecting myself is one thing. But actually being warm is another thing. Putting on a jacket doesn't guarantee that I'm going to be warm. So, al mafasid, protecting yourself against corrupting and, and harmful things is different and prioritized, it's more important, but it's different than jalb al manafi' than deriving benefits. But protection of harm is more important than deriving benefits. So it is of ill consequence if a family has a big home, wonderful car, bills are paid, but abuse is going on in the house. It doesn't matter. The fact that uh, someone's living in a nice home and in a nice place does not justify abuse and does not make it better and does not make it right and does not make it correct. If there's harm in the home, it has to be removed. So I mention these things in conclusion. Because this year, I would like for us as a community, as individuals, and as family members, as a community, to strive to protect our families, our wives, our children, our inner household, for example, to protect them from being victims of the fire from our own nafs, and obviously the fire of Jahannam, the fire of our own hard hearts, the cruelty that can emerge when we are without compassion, without sound judgment, without proper akhlaq. This year as we go from Rajab to Sha'ban to Ramadan, and we make a lot of du'as in general, that same concern we have for ourselves, let us have that same concern for the well-being of our wives, of our children, of everybody in our family. Let's look at them as a community, each other, the way that we look at our own salvation, our own benefit. What we want for ourselves, let us want the same thing for our spouses. Inshallah ta'ala, later this evening after Maghrib, we'll be talking more in detail about this issue of family matters and giving concrete advice from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, from examples of Sahabas as to how we may better improve our lives and the lives of our families in this life. And we may honor that as we honor the time of Rajab and the time of the Isra, so that we ascend we practice reaching Allah Ta'ala, getting near to Allah Ta'ala, ascending to Allah Ta'ala, not just as men, for example, not just as husbands, but as husbands with their wives together, with their children together, all of us together. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. أوصي وأوصيكم بتقوى الله قال تعالى إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما بركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد رب اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار عباد الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون أقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا